Welcome to Hot Chips 22. Session 3, Networking and Data Center. So good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the next session. Uh, I'm Christopher Sandwich from UC Berkeley. I'll be chairing this, chairing this session. Um, the session is all about networking and the data center. Um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker is Jeff Brown. He's a distinguished engineer from IBM Rochester in Minnesota. And he has extensive many years experience, he says, with server and games processors. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for giving me an opportunity f to share with you some of the work that my colleagues and I at IBM have done um, around a chip called the IBM Power Edge of Network Processor. Before I begin, I'd like to thank my uh, uh, co-authors, Sandy Woodward, Charlie Johnson, and Brian Bass for their assistance in preparing this talk and, and helping me um, get ready to, um, I'd also like to thank the, the extensive team within IBM that's been doing the development on this chip uh, for their hard work. The uh, IBM Power EN processor chip is a system on a chip that incorporates 64-bit uh, PowerPC processor cores, uh, each with four threads. Uh, there's a high-performance interconnect uh, that provides coherent interconnection for everything on the chip. We have uh, in integrated DRAM controllers, an integrated PCIe um, unit. Um, we, we have a special purpose packet processing engine uh, that connects four 10 gigabit Ethernet ports. Um, and, and there are four special function accelerators uh, included on the chip. Uh, the other thing, um, in, incorporated as well is a, uh, an extension to the on-chip um, power bus. Uh, this allows us to connect coherently four chips together. Um, that gives us effectively 256 threads in a, in a fully coherent environment. Uh, we've also incorporated in this uh, um, uh, extensive, or I should say, virtualization and hypervisor support. Um, and it, pat, it covers more than just the processors. It goes all the way through the uh, accelerators and the, um, the networking um, packet processors. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, because it supports virtualization uh, in a, in, in a four-chip configuration with 256 threads, all 256 threads can run against a single uh, image or they can be split up among multiple images and managed by the hypervisor. So we think of the edge of network as kind of the intersection between uh, network processing and packet-based network processing and um, functions and features that are common in servers, um, specifically the ease of programming uh, of an SMP model um, as well as virtualization. So some of the applications that we envision this chip um, will be used for uh, is for platforms, uh, things like uh, database and SOA uh, acceleration, um, to all the way to things like uh, compartmentalized, secure um, analytics and data reduction uh, in storage subsystems for applications targeted at a smarter planet. So here's a picture uh, of the chip and some of the statistics. Uh, it's a 45 nanometer SOI chip. It's uh, 410 square millimeters. This, uh, di this is a chip uh, die photo with some of the areas annotated. Uh, the processors are located in these blocks here with their shared caches. 
the power bus runs vertically through the chip. Um, the top portion here is the external interface uh, extensions, and these are the FIs for those. Uh, the DDR3 uh, FIs are on the right-hand side. There are four 8-byte channels. Uh, here's the, the DRAM controllers here. Um, you, can see the you can see the accelerators um, are down here, crypto, XML, regex, um, and, and the I.O. interface, specifically the packet processor, and then the PCIe are over here because they share a set of combo FIs or, or high-speed serial interfaces. Um, you may not have noticed it on the previous chart, but the, this chip has a roughly 1.4 billion transistors on it. Um, with, with that many transistors and, and the amount of function that's integrated on this chip, um, it, this is one of the most complicated chips that IBM has developed. Oops. So I'm going to take you into some of the pieces and parts that, that put this chip together. Um, and, and so let's start with the, the high-performance interconnect. Um, that, that's here. Uh, a key thing about this interconnect is that every device that's on the interconnect acts as a peer. They all participate in the coherency operations. Um, and, and as a result, um, we, we're able to, to do some things with this chip that you can't do with, with one where you have it split into two domains. Um, let me talk a little bit about the, the, the bus. It's cons it's, it has a uh, command interface and a data interface that are, that are independent. The command interface is capable of resolving one address command per bus cycle. And the data interconnect is constructed out of four 16-byte buses, two that transport data um, upwards and two that transport data downwards. Uh, it uses a 64-byte cache line. And, and one of the not features we added into this bus is, is what's called cache injection. This allows um, every device, um, of course the processors in their cache don't count, but ev every device like the packet processing engine and all the accelerators to, to inject data directly into the cache um, so that it's not necessary to go out to memory for all operations. Um, the, the bus, uh, the on-chip bus and the external bus are, are asynchronous to the units that are on the chip. This allows each of the units to run at its maximum speed as well as the buses to run at their maximum speed, so providing you know, maximum bandwidth um, and throughput. So the processor that's on, on the PowerEN chip is, as I mentioned, it's a 64-bit uh, PowerPC processor uh, using the embedded uh, architecture Turns out it's uh, 2.06, um, the 2.06 uh, embedded. We've added some things to it. Uh, specifically, we, we added a, an instruction, um, a couple of instructions, or modified a couple of instructions to help with the interfacing with the coprocessors, which I'll talk about when I talk about the coprocessors. So it supports four threads um, in a um, simultaneous multi-threading. Uh, it's in order dispatch, uh, but it, it has two concurrent issue. Um, but the thing about the two concurrent issues is that one issue is for an, an integer instruction, the other is for a floating point instruction, and they have to be for different threads. It has uh, 16k byte caches, um, and, and it implemented, as, as part of the 2.06 architecture, which was focused on um, the addition of virtualization and an MMU to support that. We, we have an MMU that's 512 entries in the TLB that supports the hardware table walk and full virtualization. So the four cores are integrated together with a, a shared L2. As you can see, each core has a, a separate interface unit that connects to a crossbar. This crossbar allows access to four L2 slices. Each slice is, is basically its own L2 uh, in, in its entirety. It includes the directories, it has the reservation station, and it's built out of EDRAM, so each slice is 512 uh, kilobytes of EDRAM, made out of multiple macros so that we have a significant amount of bandwidth that can be staged out of each slice. Um, the slices are connected onto the bus through a, a bus interface unit and then um, through an asynchronous interface directly onto the bus um, 
itself. So there's a DRAM, there are two DRAM controllers on the chip. Um, each, each DRAM controller has its own interface to the, to the power bus. Um, that's both a command and, an, and a data interface. Um, there are two channels um, for each controller. Uh, each channel is capable of attaching two DIMMs. Uh, they're either registered DIMMs or unbuffered DIMMs, and they support you know, multiple frequencies, including the, the 1600 flavor. Uh, the 64-byte cache line is, is carried out into the, to the DRAMs um, in a way that allows us, so that ECC is covered across it. Uh, that lets us, um, if we use by four, D, uh, by four DRAMs to, do a, to support a chip kill, which is important for the kind of uh, reliability kinds of applications that IBM typically uses. So now let's talk about the accelerators that are on the chip. There's four of them. Um, and in order, to get the, in order to achieve the objectives that we re were really after on this part, we, we really needed to make sure that they integrated well with the chip. So in order to do that, we created a couple of instructions or, or modified an instruction. The first one is this um, initiate coprocessor instruction, which is a way for the processor to specifically send information to the, the accelerator. Uh, the other thing we did was there's an await instruction in the PowerPC architecture, and we enhanced that to, to allow a thread to, to say, I want to wait on a reservation loss, and then the thread can go to sleep. So that when the accelerator is ready, it can issue, um, it can basically do a, a write to the correct um, uh, reservation address, and the reservation is lost, and the thread wakes up. It's a very efficient way of, of communicating. Uh, I already mentioned that uh, we have L2 cache intervention. Um, and, but the other thing that's really important about these accelerators is that every one of them has an MMU uh, associated with it. What we did was, on this interface into the power bus, we created a, a unit called the power bus interface controller. Um, and every, every uh, accelerator and the packet processing engine um, and the PCIe all attach through that, that, that PBIC. The PBIC supports, um, I'll say, the mundane operations of interfacing with the bus, but it also provides uh, a memory management unit that, that is built off or is based off of the processor MMU that allows um, the accelerators to operate in app the application space. So let's talk a little bit very quickly about how the accelerator actually works. Um, software determines that, it's, that it has a task that it's going to send to the accelerator. Um, it, it generates what's called a coprocessor request block and a coprocessor parameter block, and it does that in memory. Now, if everything's right, basically it's producing that, putting that into the L2. Then it will issue the, the initiate coprocessor instruction, or, or X switch. And the result of that is that the L2 will put onto the bus the, a coprocessor request command. And when, when the appropriate PBIC replies to that, it will push the data associated with the coprocessor request and the coprocessor parameter block uh, to the target PBIC. The PBIC then, then passes the information in the accelerator unit where there are a number of DMA engines um, so that we can process multiple commands at a time. Um, the DMA engine then works with the appropriate alg algorithm engine to, to, to implement the particular um, acceleration function. Uh, again, all the data that's used um, for, for the calculation as it's fetched from memory or written to memory is in the application address space. and um, if things are going right, um, it all happens into to the L2 that, that uh, the data is needed at. Uh, when, when the final operation is complete, then it signals back to the software. It can either do that via the wake on reservation lost I already mentioned. It can do it with interrupts, or the thread could actually be polling a uh, register to see what's going on. So now I'm going to take you through very briefly each of the accelerators, and I'll try to do this quickly. Um, the first one is a compression decompression unit. It supports RFC 1950, 51, and 52, which is essentially the deflate standard. Um, as I mentioned, air, air, the accelerator has a PBIC on the top that interfaces to the power bus. There's a data engine that handles the DMA operations and, and managing the coprocessor requests. 
there are two, there's a decompression engine and a compression engine. Uh, the decompression engine is capable of interleaving decompression operations on different streams. Um, it has to do it on one chunk of data at a time, but it can, but there's a, there's a mechanism within, uh, within the data engine that allows you, that keeps track of the history buffer and the, and the current state of that decompression so we can interleave those. Um, the compression engine does not support that. It only works on one piece of data at a time. Um, the, the object here is to supply 8 gigabits per second coming from the decompression into the data engine and 8 gigabits per second from the data engine into the compression engine and be able to sustain those rates um, continuously. So we also have what's called a crypto data mover, which is a combination unit. It, it supports uh, cryptography standards as well as a, a high function um, DMA or data mover engine. Um, like, like the other accelerators, it has a PBIC and, that interfaces to the PBUS. The, the DMA or, or data engine uh, supports multiple DMA controllers so that we can do so that we can feed data to, uh, I'll say, a large number of different algorithm engines, all simultaneously to achieve the bandwidth objectives. Uh, it supports symmetric algorithms uh, like AES and DES and, SHA, uh, and hash like SHA. Uh, it also works in a way that the data from, a, a, from one of those crypto um, engines can be passed directly to a SHA engine so we can we can support combined operations like, like uh, triple DES and SHA. So we also support uh, uh, asymmetric algorithms, uh, specifically modular math functions for RSA and elliptical curve cryptography. Uh, I mentioned the asynchronous data mover that is an independent engine. It's not part of these DMAs. It's actually part of the, the main engines. Um, and there's also a hardware-based random number generator that generates a 64-bit random number. Um, which can be used to, to support uh, FIPS 140 compliance. The XML engine uh, it is, as you'd be surprised to see, I'm sure, that has a PBIC on the top and interface to the power bus. There's a data engine that, again, manages the coprocessor requests and moving data into and out of the, X, the XML. There are four XML engines. Uh, each one has a parsing engine, which is used to, to you know, basically check to make sure that the XML document is, is well formed, has uh, the right syntax, and is used to remove white space. It also creates an internal data structure um, that's stored uh, here in, in, in this, these caches. And, 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 and so the post-processing portion of the XML engine can work on it. Uh, the post-processing engine is where all the really interesting work for XML is done. Um, things like XPath evaluation and schema validation and, and XSLT processing. The, uh, the regular expression engine, yet again, has a PBIC interfacing to the power bus. Uh, it has a, a data engine. This particular unit supports uh, eight coprocessor requests simultaneously. Uh, it's constructed out of four physical lanes. Each lane is capable of interleaving two uh, streams of, of data for search. The search itself is, is constructed from a, a, a thing called a binary, fi binary finite state machine, or BFSM. It was developed in, in IBM Research in Zurich. The, uh, the BFSM, I should say the BFSM in conjunction with a 32K byte pattern store, implements the search engine. Um, so, so basically the way this works is there's a compiler that takes a context full of, of regular expression patterns. It compiles those patterns and generates a, a, a load that goes into the pattern store. Then there's a, a, an upload manager. There's a, part of the upload manager is in hardware. Part of it is actually in software. And that, that upload manager software as well as, as well as some hardware in the chip ensures that the right patterns are, be, are currently stored in the, the set of BFSM store. So I, I currently, I, I so far talked about the processing elements, specifically the, the processors, the high performance interconnect, and the accelerators. But that in itself won't make this a, a network, be usable in a network environment. So in order to do that, we had to put a, an accelerator specifically for network functions. Um, on egress, we, 
that's used to do packet classification and filtering. It manages the buffers and, and queues, um, and it, and it uh, dispatches to the different threads uh, the specific work to be done for that, for that packet. On, on egress, uh, we have a similar set of queue management. Um, it also handles packet ordering. Um, so so with, the, with the extensive processing power, the accelerators, and, and this packet accelerator, we, we think this chip has you know, the capability of processing control plane applications and data plane applications. So a little, little bit deeper on that specific packet processor. Um, I mentioned earlier that there are four, support for four 10 gigabit Ethernet ports. Uh, each of, we believe that, that this particular engine and the, and the chip behind it is capable of handling full data rate on all four 10 gigabit Ethernet ports. Um, so I, I, I mentioned that this offloads some of the, the centralized functions that are required for media speed operations. Um, another key point about this unit is, is that it's broken up. It, it basically has two modes, an endpoint mode, which is, which is what we'd call a host Ethernet adapter. Um, and it, it uh, basically terminates L4 or level 4 and above um, connections. It has a very sophisticated software interface that is actually a derivative of, of a, the interface we've used on previous chips. Um, it supports uh, checksum assist for, for um, IP version 4 and version 6. And, and uh, it has within it, um, I should say, as part of the base function, I, I wanted to mention this as well, um, we included a BFSM um, that I mentioned earlier on the regular expression pattern matcher. We included a BFSM and a small pattern store into this unit for a, a more flexible um, classification and, and, and matching on, on the five tuple or the information in, in the packet. So the other thing that's important to recognize is that this, this particular uh, unit supports 16 uh, virtual uh, uh, logical partitions. So, so the way this works is, is that logical partitions on the, SIP, on the chip will see their own version of, of the, the adapter. Uh, the other mode we have is called network no node mode, which is really all about uh, a, a bump on a wire uh, where packets are, are, are ingressed and then processing is, occurs and then they're egressed. So my, the last unit that's on the chip um, that I haven't mentioned yet is the PCIe Express uh, unit. Um, when, I, when I showed the very first picture of the chip, I mentioned that the, the packet processor and the PCI Express unit are, were, were close to each other and close to the IOs. And the reason for that is that the chip has 28 lanes of um, HSS uh, phi, uh, each capable of supporting uh, uh, Zowie rates or or the PCIe Gen 2 rates. And, and what we've done is we've put together a flexible switch that, that lets us configure how we want to apply those 28 lanes, whether all for, for Ethernet or all for, you know, uh, 16 wide pipe for PCIe, for example, uh, in, in a flexible way, depending upon how the chip can get, will get used. The, uh, the PCIe unit itself is broken up into has supports two ports. Um, each port is designed to to support a root complex, so so that this can be used sort of as a as a host and attach PCI adapters to it. Um, it implements IBM's internal um, I/O uh, architecture called IODA, and the root complex also puts also puts a, um, a manages translation through a cached element called a TCE cache. On one of the ports, um, this one right here, the one that, that can support the 16-byte interface or the 16-wide interface, um, it also supports an endpoint end mode. So this part can be used on a PCIe card um, as all the processing functions required for that PCIe card. Um, it's probably appropriate to mention that because of the virtualization uh, that we're trying to do with this chip, it also supports. Uh, uh, SIR, SRIOV virtualization. Um, it has, uh, as I mentioned before, it has an interface through the PBIC so that it does, in fact, 
uh, get communicated through uh, coprocessor requests for DMA operations and things like that. So the, um, the function that we've integrated on this chip, um, the specific functions, as well as the advanced, I'll, I'll say technology we've included for virtualization um, and, and, and multiprocessing and ease of, of programming, um, makes this a part that, that we, and because it's packet-based as well as server kind of based in the intersection, we make this, we think this is really well targeted for emerging applications in that overlap space that is the edge of network. Um, we have uh, significant throughput computing that's very power efficient. Uh, we have, uh, you know, it supports advanced data processing on the payloads uh, to, in support of deeper networking functions. And all that together, um, we think this is a, a good platform for appliances and other applications targeted at uh, an IBM Smarter Planet applications or solutions. So with that, um, thank you. Questions? So we have time for a few questions. Uh, please state your name and affiliation. Hi, Rajan Goel, Cavium Networks. Can you share some specific details about your XML and uh, regex engine, like performance you didn't mention, and also how many rules you can fit into your 32 kilobyte on-chip memory? Um, I think the answer is no. <laughs> um, not, not because I can't share it. I'd have to refer to some, some documents to actually give you the real numbers. If I share them with you, I'll get them wrong, because I'm not real good at memorizing numbers. So. Um, so I will we'll talk offline. Maybe. Yes. Don Banks, Cisco. Uh, could you say something about the way you virtualize the SOC devices? Um, the coprocessor devices, how, how they're virtualized, are they virtualized the same way that the packets processor is? There's N instances that appear to the virtual the regions? I'm not sure I follow the question. There's kind of a, there's, a lot of echo. I think the question was, how do you virtualize the accelerators? Right. Yes. Okay. So the, um, as, as I mentioned, the, the PBIC or the Powerbus Interface Controller has, has within it uh, an, an, a, an MMU, right. all right? And, and that MMU uh, supports exactly the same uh, structure that the processor does, which means, which means that entries include things like processor IDs and and thread IDs, and and so when a coprocessor request is sent to a, a particular accelerator, uh, it, it actually brings with it the the um, I'll call it application state, so so that it knows so so that the the accelerator knows um, you know what process ID it's supposed to use when it when it attempts to act on behalf of the thread. So the isolation is guaranteed by the MMU. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is Paul Jensen from Microsoft. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you're actually generating the random numbers for the random number instruction. Is that, is that some kind of physical process? Uh, or, yeah, or? It's, a, it's a physical process. Um, it, if you, it, it's actually the same structure that's used for the, the Xbox 360 random number generator. Uh, it's the same technique. There's three separate circuits that generate uh, a, a random stream, and then those are all convolved together to, and then that's used to generate the 64-bit um, random number. Uh, one of them is 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 a VC, one of the units is a VCO. Um, I can't remember what the other two are. It's been a long time since I was involved in that design. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think we have time for just one more question from this side. Can you hear now? Yeah. Uh, you have mentioned that um, this is a power efficient design. So could you talk uh, to some power numbers? Um, yeah, I can, I can mention a couple briefly. Um, at, at, uh, at a processor frequency of, of about two gigahertz, um, with what we think are reasonable applications running on it, the, the power consumed by this part will be on the range to 50 and 60 watts. 
um, for the whole chip. Um, that's all the accelerators, uh, the, the I.O. interfaces, everything together. Okay, great. Thank you, Jeff. Right. Thank you. Uh, so our next speaker is Salesh Kumar. Um, he received a PhD in 2008 from um, Washington University, and he was uh, with Cisco, uh, but about a year ago he joined Huawei. Uh, thank you, Christy. Um, so uh, I'm Shalesh Kumar, and today I will be talking about uh, smart memory, which is a new type of memory architecture to enable very high-performance packet forwarding. And here, by high performance, I mean uh, data rates of 100G, 400G, and 1 terabit per second. So uh, in this project, uh, Bill Lynch was the lead of this project. Uh, I defined the architecture, and there's a large team uh, who is right now building this chip. Um, in this talk, uh, I will uh, first talk about some of the challenges that we face uh, in very high performance packet forwarding. Uh, then I will uh, introduce smart memory and I will, uh, I will explain how smart memory addresses all those problems. And finally, I will go over a smart memory architecture. So uh, first, we will go over some of the challenges that we face uh, in very high performance packet forwarding. So if you look at most of the packet forwarding applications, such as uh, lookups or uh, statistics uh, counters or uh, buffering or linked list management, you'll see that uh, the first problem is that uh, we need to do a large number of sequential memory operations. So for example, if you look at uh, lookup operations, a lot of lookups are done by, using, by traversing some sort of state machine. So to traverse that state machine, we have to do a, a series of memory operations. And uh, this sequential interdependent memory operation leads to a performance bottleneck. Now, a second type of applications include uh, read, modify, write operation. Uh, very simple uh, modify operations such as uh, counter increment, counter decrement operations, or linked list operations, or uh, uh, policing operation, leaky bucket policing operations. In these types of operations, again, we have to read data, modify data, and write back data. Uh, and finally, uh, the linked list data structures are very popular uh, to, uh, uh, to support uh, various types of packet processing. Uh, for example, linked lists are used to manage uh, buffer pools to store packets. They are also used to uh, implement uh, packet queues uh, in which packets are stored and scheduled to provide quality of service. So if you look at these applications, uh, it turns out that these are highly memory intensive operations and we, we do a lot of uh, memory operations. And as far as computation is concerned, uh, there's very modest amount of computation required. Now, uh, when we implement uh, these uh, functions in a uh, real system, the traditional approach is to use a packet processor ASIC, which is uh, shown on the right side bottom, and uh, some sort of uh, commodity memory subsystem, such as DRAM or RLDRAM. So a uh, memory subsystem is used to store all the data structures, and uh, packet processors are used to process data in memory. Now, as I mentioned, in this type of approach, uh, uh, one of the most uh, uh, serious performance bottleneck is the memory and chip I.O. bandwidth, because data has to be continuously moved from memory subsystem to the packet processing subsystem. Uh, now, uh, memory latency creates another serious performance bottleneck, especially for applications such as uh, sequential uh, memory references application. And finally, to provide uh, atomic accesses, such as uh, to provide, uh, you know, to increment counters from multi-processor uh, uh, environment, we have to lock data structures. So this locking creates another serious performance bottleneck. Now here, I will quickly go over a, a brief uh, illustration of one of these uh, performance bottlenecks. So here again, uh, I'm showing a memory subsystem and packet processing subsystem and they are connected together using an interconnection network. So here uh, I am showing a simple IP lookup. Again, this is a very simplified version of IP lookup. So IP lookup is uh, one of the basic functions of packet forwarding, and uh, IP lookup is commonly implemented by a tree data structure, and these trees are walked uh, uh, from uh, root to the leaf. So, uh, in these types of workloads, uh, as you can see, we have to do sequential memory operations. 
So we have to access memory uh, repeatedly a large number of times, which, uh, which uh, leads to very high number of transactions between memory subsystem and packet processing subsystem. Uh, now, since uh, these memories often have high uh, latencies, and also uh, since uh, uh, as far as packet processing ASIC is concerned, uh, these uh, processors have their own interconnection networks that adds to latency. So uh, the total uh, memory plus interconnect latency is often very high. Uh, now, this latency leads to a very low IPC in packet processors. Uh, now, uh, to hide uh, this memory latency, uh, what people do, they use a large number of processors. Now, once, we, once you have a very large number of processors, then the interconnection latency further increases, which makes the problem uh, more complex. Now, here is another, another uh, simple illustration of performance bottleneck. So here, uh, previously, I, uh, I, I went over lookups. Lookups are a relatively simpler operation because we have to only read the data. We don't have to write anything into memory. Now, if we talk about uh, operations such as uh, linked list and counters and policers, for these types of operations, we have to read data from memory, we have to modify it, and then we have to write it back. So now, to enable such operations, we have to, uh, we have to somehow lock uh, data before we can modify it. So for example, here I'm showing uh, uh, the steps involved in a very simple NQ and DQ operation. Uh, here, uh, the red boxes are locking operations, uh, lock, lock acquisitions, and the green boxes are lock release. So as you can see, even for simple NQ and DQ operation, we have to uh, lock and unlock. That uh, adds to a very large number of transactions in memory. Uh, for operations such as counters, which are really, really simple, uh, we again have to lock the data structures, which adds to a uh, number of transactions required from between memory and packet processing chips. Now, uh, locks are often kept in memory because da these data structures are very large. For example, in, in uh, typical network systems, number of uh, counters are very large. So before we can modify a counter, we have to lock it, and we have to provide a per counter lock. So usually, these locks are also kept in memory. Now, as I said, uh, this locking adds uh, more transactions. So we require more memory bandwidth. And not only that, but one of the serious problem is that when we are accessing the same counter, for example, or the same queue, when we are doing NQ and DQ operation in the same queue, then our performance drops down dramatically because we lose all the parallelism. So our worst case performance is uh, severely limited. So this was a kind of illustration about uh, some of the bottlenecks uh, in packet processing workloads. Now I will uh, now quickly talk about uh, smart memory, and I will show how smart memory addresses uh, these performance bottlenecks in these uh, network workloads. So uh, the real problem uh, in the previous workloads were the fact that uh, we were doing all the computations uh, far from data. So compute was in one chip, and data was uh, stored in another chip, and this latency was the serious performance bottleneck. And the second bottleneck was to enable atomic operation, we have to lock data structures. That created another performance bottleneck. Uh, now, uh, fortunately, uh, for uh, packet processing workloads that I just mentioned earlier, the amount of compute is very modest. Uh, so uh, that is why performance is often limited by a number of memory references. So since compute is limited, what we can do is we can make uh, memory much smarter by identifying key computation elements uh, that are often carried out in network workloads, and then attaching uh, these compute elements uh, next to memory subsystem. So, so here, uh, I just added uh, these computation blocks next to each of the memory uh, block in my memory subsystem. Uh, second, what we can do is we can even uh, move the locking and unlocking logic next to memory. And finally, uh, we can even enable uh, these memory subsystem or these memory elements to talk to each other to enable sequential uh, memory references much more efficiently. So once we combine all these three, all these three features, we have a, a much smarter memory where we can do compute uh, inside the memory subsystem. And not only that we can do compute, we can also perform atomic operations because locking also occurs inside memory. And we can also enable uh, highly sequential and interdependent memory reference uh, functions, because these memory subsystems can uh, has a local interconnection network now. 
So uh, this type of memory subsystem is kind of very abstract or very high level over high level definition of smart memory. And uh, once we uh, add these capabilities in the memory subsystem, then uh, we can do a lot of work uh, for very few transactions between our packet processing chip and the memory subsystem. Uh, this will uh, significantly reduce the I.O. bandwidth required uh, between packet processing ASIC and uh, memory subsystem. Uh, this will also significantly cut the uh, operation latency because now we don't have to repeatedly go to memory and uh, come back with data. Uh, this will also significantly increase the IPC uh, from packet processing ASIC point of view. Uh, that will uh, significantly improve performance and you know, we don't really need very large number of parallel contexts in ASICs anymore. And uh, uh, this will basically also uh, give us very high uh, worst case performance. So usually we hit the worst case performance when we are trying to touch the same data structure repeatedly. In which case, in the traditional implementation, we have to lock the data structure, uh, which limits performance. Now, uh, I will quickly give you a very brief overview of smart memory uh, architecture. So the first question that we need to ask is, how much memory uh, capacity and bandwidth we need for uh, various types of packet processing functions? So here in this picture, uh, I'm showing some of the uh, popular packet processing functions, such as different types of lookups and counters and uh, queue management functions. And on the y-axis, I'm showing the uh, amount of memory bandwidth that we need at 100G uh, data rates. And on the x-axis, uh, I'm uh, listing the memory capacity required by these features. So, uh, now, uh, as far as bandwidth and capacity is concerned, uh, if we use a traditional uh, DDR3 DRAM memory, which is one of the cheapest and most popular uh, memory subsystem today, then it turns out that even eight, eight channels of DDR3 DRAM is not sufficient to implement most of these functions. Now, uh, in smart memory, uh, we not only use uh, DDR3 DRAM, we also use uh, embedded memory technology based on ADRAM. So the green region shows the bandwidth and capacity available by using, for example, 64 banks of 32 megabyte EDRAM. So as you can see, EDRAM can, has a very high bandwidth, and especially if we do all the computation locally, then uh, it provides very high uh, bandwidth. And we can support uh, uh, most of the features in terms of bandwidth. However, uh, capacity is still a problem. So it turns out that uh, there are some features that we can't support with either uh, EDRAM or uh, DDR3 DRAM cost effectively. So uh, in smart memory, what we do is we have invented a large number of uh, innovative algorithms. Uh, and uh, with these algorithms, what we do is we try to split the data structure into high capacity and low bandwidth and uh, high bandwidth and low capacity uh, portions and we store the high bandwidth and low capacity part of data structure in EDRAM and the other part in DDR3 DRAM. So for each and every feature, uh, smart memory uses these algorithmic techniques to split the data structure. Now this is a very high level architecture of uh, smart memory. Um, in smart memory, we have integrated packet processing. Uh, in the first generation smart memory, we have integrated packet processors. So on the left side, I have uh, got packet processors. And in the middle, I have, I'm showing uh, 16 tiles of uh, these smart memory elements. So we have EDRAM, and EDRAM has a tightly coupled uh, computation engine. Now these computation engines uh, provide a very large number of simple packet forwarding features. And we have two types of interconnect. Uh, there's an interconnect uh, to move uh, messages from packet processors to smart memory uh, grid. And there's a dedicated uh, local interconnect uh, for smart memories to talk to each other. In addition to this EDRAM, we also have uh, uh, eight channels of DDR3 DRAM memory, and uh, we use exactly the same computation uh, engine to uh, work on data that is stored in DDR3 DRAM. So here is a very simple illustration about how we use these types, of, these two types of memory subsystem to implement various types of packet processing functions. So here uh, in this triangle, I'm showing the, uh, uh, an IP lookup tree that I want to store in this memory subsystem and I want to parse uh, from root to leaf. 
So what we can do is we can split the data into top half and, and bottom half. Since top half is compact and requires large number of accesses, we store the top half in uh, EDRAM-based smart memory. And we store the bottom half, which is usually very large and requires very few accesses. We store that part of data structure in DDR3 DRAM. Once we have split the data like this, from that point on, uh, we uh, send messages from packet processing codes to smart memory blocks. And at, sm at these smart memory blocks, we read uh, the relevant data from memory, and we do all the computations locally. And once we are done with this computation, we move uh, the intermediate data and uh, the message uh, to next smart memory tiles using the local intercon uh, interconnect. And at once we are done with the uh, processing inside the embedded smart memory, at that point we send the intermediate data and command to the smart memory engine that works on DRAM data. And then we uh, work on DRAM data, and finally at the end we have a result available which is sent back to a packet processors. Now uh, in smart memory we have defined APIs for a very large number of functions. Today we have more than 16 functions in a smart memory and we pretty much cover the entire spectrum of common packet processing functions. Now, uh, let me quickly talk about the uh, I.O. technology, the chip I.O. technology that we use in smart memory. So in addition to uh, this on-chip packet processor, smart memory can also work together with, a, off, with an off-the-shelf packet processor chip. And uh, it turns out that even though smart memory uh, reduces the chip I.O. bandwidth dramatically by uh, keeping a large number of communication on chip, we still need a very high amount of chip I.O. bandwidth at speeds, of, uh, at speeds of 400G and 1 terabit per second data rates. So uh, to optimize the chip I.O. bandwidth, smart memory does not use commodity uh, memory interface technology. Rather, smart memory uses uh, highly optimized serial uh, cerdas based uh, interconnections. So in the, in the picture here, uh, I am showing uh, the evolution of uh, memory interface technology in terms of speed. And it is very clear that uh, memory interface is not scaling uh, at the same rate at which semiconductor uh, speeds are scaling. On the other side, uh, serial links uh, do scale at the same rate at which semiconductors uh, rate scale. So that is why serial links are much more optimized or much more, you know, uh, uh, be better choice compared to using a standard uh, memory interfaces. Uh, on top of that, uh, these serial IOs also provide a much higher throughput, uh, requires much fewer pins, and also requires much lower power at the same performance level compared to standard uh, memory interfaces. So here, uh, in this picture, I am showing uh, one of the, again, very high level application of smart memory. Uh, sm the main objective of smart memory is to enable uh, packet forwarding applications or very simple packet forwarding functions at very, very high data rates. So if you look at traditional line cards uh, at very high performance, these line cards use a large number of network processors. They use uh, uh, different types of chips uh, to implement different types of functions, such as TCAMs for lookups, uh, custom ASICs to implement some uh, counter feature or packet buffer feature, uh, some custom chips to implement traffic management, which involve uh, different types of linked list and queue operations, and also a large number of uh, uh, memory subsystems, such as uh, DRAM or SRAM. Now here, uh, these types of traditional line cards require very large number of uh, DRAMs because usually what they do, they uh, replicate banks inside DRAM to achieve uh, high bandwidth or to address the worst case uh, performance concerns. Now on the right side, I'm showing uh, same line card at same performance level using uh, smart memory. So since smart memory integrates almost all uh, common packet forwarding functions, we don't have to use any uh, custom parts in a uh, line card using smart memory. Uh, we can use the same chip, the same smart memory in different types of configurations. Uh, for example, in one configuration, smart memory can provide all types of lookup functions. In another configuration, the same chip can provide a traffic management feature and so on. So in this architecture, now uh, we have only two types of chips in the whole system. We have smart memory and we have network processors. So if we go for this design approach, based on our estimates, uh, the cost, power, and board area 
all of them can be significantly reduced compared to traditional line cards. Uh, and not only that, actually it turns out that uh, using a smart memory, we can uh, enable a very high uh, rate packet forwarding. Uh, for example, based on our evaluation, uh, it's extremely difficult to provide uh, 400G and one terabit per second packet forwarding rates using traditional commodity memory subsystems. So uh, it's very clear that smart memory uh, provides a very cost-efficient way to build next-generation uh, network systems. Now, uh, here are uh, the summary of the presentation and summary of the smart memory. So in this presentation, we, see we uh, went over the uh, packet performance uh, bottlenecks that, we, that commonly arise uh, in network systems. And we have shown that uh, one of the main reasons of these bottlenecks is that data is often uh, kept far from computation elements. Uh, and therefore, the performance is limited by I.O. and memory bandwidth. Then we have introduced smart memory, uh, in which uh, the whole idea of smart memory is to keep uh, compute uh, close to data, as well as keep uh, lock uh, close to data so that we can provide very high performance atomic operations. And also, smart memory enables uh, different memory elements to talk to each other locally so that we can avoid a lot of uh, off-chip transactions. Uh, as far as advantages of smart memory is concerned, uh, we have seen that uh, smart memory uh, significantly reduces the chip I.O. bandwidth, uh, which leads to very high performance and uh, low latency, as well as uh, significantly lower power consumption. Uh, uh, finally, smart memory is very, very feature-rich and highly programmable. Today, in smart memory, we have got a large number of functions. Uh, today, we have 16 features inside smart memory. All these features are simple, but they are a uh, foundation of any uh, packet processing application. And uh, smart memory is fully programmable in the sense that we can use entire smart memory chip for one function, or we can split the uh, entire smart memory into very small, uh, very small partitions, and uh, each partition can implement a given feature. Uh, so that's pretty much all. So thank you. So we have time for a few questions. Uh, please state your name and affiliation. Hi, Rick Merritt from EE Times. Uh, are you working on this alone or with any other OEMs or chip vendors? Uh, we are working on this alone. And can you share any specifics about the status and performance and power numbers? Perform uh, power numbers? So uh, in the first generation, uh, we are integrating packet processing cores uh, with smart memory. I can't really disclose how many packet processing cores we have on this chip. Uh, we, although as far as smart memory is concerned, we have 32 megabyte of smart memory on this chip. And this chip is expected to consume about 60 watt of power uh, at 100 gig data rates. Uh, Shakir Cesar from Titan IC Systems. Could you share with us the technology, uh, uh, EDRAM technology you're using to build your smart memory part? Yeah, so uh, IBM is our foundry uh, in, for, for this chip, and we use IBM's EDRAM. Uh, we are building this chip in 45. Uh, at that, and our clock frequency is gigahertz. And um, we are using the uh, EDRAM that has got a TRC of roughly four nanosecond. So in the worst case, we can do about 250 million accesses uh, in the worst case, although uh, we run memory in pipeline mode, so we can uh, get very high performance in average uh, case. There's no more questions, a little bit of time. I had a question. So at what point is this smart memories are not just dumb processors? I mean, you, isn't it just a multiprocessor array? What's really different than having a large array of simple processors? Yeah, so, so in the first generation, basically, uh, we built this smart memory, and then we made this decision to integrate smart memory with our packet processor. Because at 100G data rate, uh, we found that we don't have to really build two chips. We can live with one chip solution. However, going forward to support 400G and one terabit per second data rate, we plan to build a standalone smart memory chip with much larger uh, memory. 
and then we will build systems using network processors and smart memory. So our final speaker in the, the session today is Drew Alduino, and he's a senior optical researcher at Intel. Uh, he received his bachelor's from Bucknell University and his master's and PhD from the University of New Mexico, um, which was on a Vixel-based smart pixel technology. Uh, since then, the last 10 years, he's been working at Intel developing silicon photonics technology. He's going to tell us today about some of their latest developments. Thank you, Christy. Um, so thank you all. Thank you to the committee for inviting us today to, for a little bit of a change of pace. Instead of talking about integrated circuits, CPU design, network architectures, we're going to talk about an optical phi layer. Basically all the chips that uh, Jeff and, and our previous speaker talked about in the terabit per second bandwidth, we're going to talk about how we're going to provide that in the future using a silicon photonics technology we're developing here at the Intel Corporation. So today we'll be talking about the title of the talk, a demonstration of a high-speed four-channel integrated silicon photonics WDM link with an integrated hybrid silicon laser. We'll talk some about the previous results, sort of give you some background so that uh, some of the IC designers here will understand what I talk about when I talk about silicon photonics. Then we'll go into the silicon photonics technology itself, and then hopefully some link results which will be meaningful to you and helpful as you think about the things we'll talk about in the summary slide. Intel has been working on silicon photonics for eight plus years now. Cell phone. Nice call. Um, you know, over those eight years, we've published many sort of world-class nature publications. When we started thinking about silicon photonics optical links for computing applications, we broke the problem up into what we thought were the six major categories that were required to produce this. Um, friendly technology. Lasers, data encoders or modulators, light detectors, the laser itself, and then of course, you know, basic la uh, light routing for wavelength dependent switching, directing it around, coupling in and out, and then sort of the intelligence around those technologies which are required to sort of make them low cost and manufacturable in the types of environments we're talking about. Uh, some key performance metrics such as the 40 gigabit per second modulator that we published uh, in 2007, the uh, hybrid laser 2006 we'll go through uh, in some more detail moving forward. What we have published previously and discussed previously has been the single component sort of demonstrations, which you would consider, I guess, as an IC designer as the best transistors out there or certain best gate oxides out there or something like that. Uh, and although we've gotten very good results, clearly you can't put an individual transistor in the system and think it's going to be all that useful for you. What we'll be presenting today is essentially the next step in the evolution of the technology, which is the integration of these individual optical components together into a larger system, what we would call an optical subsystem. So here you can see we'll integrate several of those technologies together and into an optical, uh, integrated optical receiver or several of those technologies together into an integrated optical transmitter. And we'll be talking about the details of those as we move forward after I sort of give you a better idea of what each of the components would be. Certainly silicon photonics has a lot of promise. A lot of people have been publishing. Certainly we think about the integration of silicon photonics with CMOS uh, electronics moving forward. Certainly there's a like, great deal of advantage for that. But I don't know if that's necessarily an idea whose time has come. And so when you get up to ask me questions at the end, if you ask me when is this going to come, I'll, 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 I'll give you a nice tap dance sort of answer. But at the moment, we don't see this as really the big focus of the, of the uh, technology development that we're doing right now. So what is it that we're talking about? What is silicon photonics? Uh, we have a technology, we call it the silicon optical modulator here, uh, based upon what is known as a mock sender interferometer. Essentially, we have an incoming light beam coming in here. We divide the light beam into two equal intensity data streams, and then we interfere them together. Uh, the analogy I guess I like to use is sort of uh, soldiers marching across a bridge. If you had a column of soldiers, maybe 10 across, you put five soldiers walking across a bridge on one side, five on the other. They walked across the same distance. They came back on the far end. They would be completely in step with each other. You'd never know that they had separated. If, however, you, you put one of those columns of soldiers through a, a pit of mud or something, you slowed them down so that they got out of phase with each other, when they interfered back at the end, they would be out of phase, and you have completely uh, dissonance there. This is what our modulator is based on. It's called uh, interference. You can see that the device is fabricated in silicon. It's essentially a reverse bias PN junction. The speed of light in silicon, it turns out, is dependent upon many things, one of which is carrier concentration. 
So if we bias and, and um, inject carriers into and out of the PN phase junction, we change the speed of light and we create this interference effect that we had talked about. One of the very nice things about this concept is that it is stable over both temperature and wavelength. Um, and so uh, it works very well, we think, for these applications. We have demonstrated, as I talked previously, 40 gigabits per second using this device. Uh, for those of you not so familiar using an eye diagram, what you're really looking for is a nice open symmetric eye so that your phi system can make a nice decision in the center of the eye at the center of the voltage and make a one zero transition. Uh, this is obviously demonstrated 40 gigabits per second, but the small signal model shows you that we have some bandwidth pass there. Um, in fact, simulation shows that we have uh, intrinsic limitation, limitations due to the carrier dynamics even higher than that. Clearly, just having your data encoded in an optical data stream doesn't help you very much. Intel's in the business of electronic computers, as I suppose most people are here. So really what you want in the end is an optical to electrical data converter. And that's what we have here, a photo detector, which can takes the optical data stream and converts it into electrons. Uh, again, a PN junction. Here, we're integrating germanium on top of a silicon photonics waveguide. The germanium has a different performance over wavelength than silicon. So while silicon is transparent to light at the infrared, if you hold up a, a wafer of silicon and you were, I was able to detect it light in the infrared, much like the, you know, the special operations soldiers in Iraq or something, you'd see right through it. Uh, germanium, however, would be absorptive and gray, just like silicon is in the visible. So adding germanium here allows us to make this silicon really an optical to electrical converter. Um, making a PN junction out of it allows us to sweep the carriers out. Uh, and in fact, we've been able to demonstrate this performance also at very high bandwidth, uh, 40 gigabits per second again for this device. Again, a small signal bandwidth uh, in excess of 30 gigahertz. The things we like to understand about these is that it's not only the bandwidth of these devices, obviously, which matters when you're trying to integrate them into a system. It also has to be very efficient. It also has to operate the wavelength you care about. It also has to operate with low sort of what you would call off current so that you can delineate the on and off. This device allows us to demonstrate all three of these. So uh, again, helping us demonstrate the, the high speed lengths that we're talking about. One of maybe the Achilles heels of silicon for silicon photonics or optical links is that it is not what we call direct band gap material. It doesn't readily convert electrons to light, uh, much like it doesn't really convert light to electrons very well. And we integrate germanium. Here we're integrating indium phosphide on top of a silicon substrate to allow us to get a very low cost, high performance laser integrated on a wafer scale processing with silicon photonics. Uh, the concept here is we take the indium phosphide, we bond it on top of the silicon, a wafer scale process eventually. We fabricate the laser. Now the laser actually doesn't exist only in the silicon or only in the indium phosphide, but in fact it's the marriage of the two together which creates the laser itself. Uh, the advantage, of, of course, of a wafer scale process is that you can do many, many of these at the same time, much less like you can make billions of transistors at a time. Um, the other very nice thing about this is that you can actually use, take advantage of, sort of some of the semiconductor or CMOS processing techniques to create actually very low cost, very accurate wavelength, hopefully high performance silicon photonics lasers as well by actually fabricating that sort of mirrors or wavelength dependent mirrors in the silicon with CMOS techniques. And, as we know, lithography on silicon is very advanced. So here we could, in some sense, bond one piece of indium phosphide in an array of waveguides, create in one photolithography step a whole array of different colors of gratings, and then now, through the same exact processing steps across the wafer scale, we can fabricate an array of silicon photonics lasers, each at the wavelength that we require, to create this sort of uh, wavelength array, which, as I'll show you later, we can multiplex down and give very high bandwidth density. So that, that hopefully is a quick introduction to what silicon photonics is for those of you who, who spend more of your time worrying about network and CPU architectures. What are we talking about today? Today it is, as I described hopefully earlier, the integration of many of these components into individual dye to create an end-to-end -end hybrid silicon photonics link. So here you can see a photomicrograph of the transmit chip, here of the receive chip, and here's a block diagram of sort of the technologies which are integrated here. Here you can see the hybrid lasers, an array of four of them. Uh, again, an indium phosphide dye. Here we have four high-speed modulators integrated together using a multiplexer down into one optical fiber. So this one optical fiber now has four colors of data streams. The beauty of light, of course, is that at different wavelengths, they don't interfere with each other, so we can get very high bandwidth density down this one fiber. 
on the receive side, we do the opposite. We take a demultiplexer and physically divide the colors out, and then we put four of these silicon germanium photo detectors operating here at 10 gigabits per second to demultiplexer or to convert the optical data stream back into an electrical data stream. Hopefully a, a little bit more detail here. The hybrid lasers, again, into the modulators. An electrical data stream obviously has to be integrated into the, into the modulators, and we use a separate CMOS IC to do that multiplexer here. One, obviously, of the challenges of putting together an optical link or maybe a silicon photonics link is that you want to integrate this here with a CPU system, right, or, or a network architecture system. Uh, as we'll talk about later, one of the keys for that is low cost, sort of high volume, uh, and the connector concept, which I'll show you about in a little bit, allows us to do this in what we think is a sort of PCB-like manufacturing type of environment. The receive chip again does the opposite of this. Same sort of connection mechanism relying on V-grooves on the silicon substrate to align an optical fiber. We multiplex them out. And we can get these data streams out to the, to the rest of the system. Again, through an integrated circuit. This is a picture of how it actually worked and looked in the lab. Um, give you a concept of scale. This die here itself was about 20 millimeters long. Here's the driver IC, and we put this onto an organic substrate, much like you would put any integrated circuit onto. Uh, this was designed to integrate in with the test system with what we call a socketable edge-mounted connector. And then the whole transmitter package itself was integrated with an optical connector to give us uh, a link into the system. On the receive side, again, the opposite. You can see that the receiver die here was actually bigger than the integrated circuit, uh, but the test system was exactly the same, another edge-mounted socketable connector. Again, for us, the real focus here was trying to develop and demonstrate a technology which showed the entire range of technologies required to integrate this into a system, and not just, as we'd done previously, a very high operating piece of sort of silicon in the middle of the optical link, but really the end-to-end -end link and the technologies, the suite of technologies required here to make it usable in the system. Uh, the system test uh, setup itself. Um, those boards I showed you before sort of buried underneath this heat sink on the transmit side and here on the receive side. You can see that this is what's required actually to get 40 gigabits per second into a test system. And so when you know, our, our colleagues from Huawei and IBM start developing these chips which really can push out a terabit per second, hopefully we can get rid of these SMA connectors here and we'll just integrate those next to those chips there. Um, in the end though, this is all the support circuitry required. Here are some bias conditions, some laser diodes, control for the IC. Here, obviously, are the SMA, the physical connectors, which brings us to our test equipment. And on the receive side, the same thing. Here's an optical cable with a clunky sort of lab-based uh, fiber holder. Uh, but in the end, I think one of the more important things to take away is that one of our key design criteria was we wanted to work uh, in a, what we thought was a reasonable environment. And so this system is air-cooled. Um, most of what you'll see in sort of very, very high-performance trans-Pacific, transatlantic cables who use dense WDM is a lot of sort of specialized cooling equipment. We clearly didn't want to be in that environment, as those aren't really readily available in a network. Um, so uh, I've talked about the link. I've given you some pictures of what it is, and I've told you what the components themselves look like. The link itself works, and to prove it, I've shown you images. Apparently, that, that proves it. Um, performance. <laughs> It's always a picture. You've built it if you can show a SEM image, and you've made it work if you can show an eye diagram. Um, extinction ratio, so the on-off ratio is good. Rise fall time, total jitter. Uh, all these things are relatively consistent across all four channels. Um, and then we have, in the end, sort of how much power do we have out of our link? Two milliwatts to nine milliwatts out of the, out of the optical link. So there's really a reasonable amount of, of margin here in the link performance, even at the first demonstration. One of the keys for doing WDM sort of optical links is, of course, that you need to line up all of those portions of the network, all of those components which are sensitive to wavelength, uh, have to be lined up together. You obviously want to be able to do that passively in a manufacturing environment. If you have to do that by temperature tuning the various elements, which is obviously done for the very highest end performance applications, you can do that, but it costs you power. Clearly, in a network for a, in a, an architecture, you care very much about power efficiency, so you want to be able to do this passively. In this case, we chose uh, channels which are spaced 20 nanometers apart on a commercially sort of recognized uh, CWDM or coarse wavelength division multiplexing standard. Uh, again, no temperature tuning. So this thing was just running in free air with a, with a fan blowing on the transmitter. Uh, the alignment of all these channels, the transmitter uh, represented by this red, the, uh, the 
sort of multiplexer here in the dark and the demultiplex there, there in the dotted lines, all lined up to within a nanometer. And so our link budget was only impacted by a fraction of a dB due to this passive mismatch of the wavelength component. Um, so operation of the entire link now, instead of the transmitter, as I showed you before, you can see some more impact from the, the receive side test equipment. It turns out that just the cables themselves and the connectors actually have a big impact on the performance. Um, but nevertheless, the entire link closes with uh, good performance. Uh, again, uh, nice output optical eye diagrams, our traveling wave silicon modulator that I talked about previously. Um, you know, one of the key parameters with that uh, we were focused on was obviously making it low power, which meant that we wanted to integrate it with a CMOS driver. Uh, we developed and designed our own uh, driver IC in a CMOS process with 1.3 volts drive across the modulator, so a little bit higher maybe than the cutting edge CMOS voltage swing. Still able to give very, very good extinction ratios and comparable rise and fall times. You could say nice open eyes in the center of these, which allowed us to make nice good uh, low bit error rate uh, um, measurement. This maybe is a little bit too optically link wonky for, for maybe the entire audience, so I'll hit it relatively quickly. But clearly what you want when you look at your bit error rate is you want it to be nice and linear over power. If you put less power in there, the eye gets smaller. You want it to be nice and predictable. If you start to see nonlinearities there, there's effects in the link that you don't well understand. Uh, the fact that this is nice and linear gives us nice confidence in that. The other thing, obviously, that you care about is that you'd like this power, which is actually a negative dB, to be as close to a positive number as possible, which means you have more, actually, you want it this way as much as possible, which gives you more and more sensitivity and more and more margin. So essentially, for in a network, the lower this number is, the more fiber you can stick between the transmitter and the receiver, the more throw you can get through your network. Um, again, jitter obviously matters an awful lot. For those of you interested in networks at all, you think about phi's at all, you think very much about the timing margin. Uh, here we have a time uh, total jitter of about 43 picoseconds and 100 picosecond bit period, so we're in pretty good shape here. Um, engineers being engineers, certainly in Intel labs, we like to push things as hard as we can. We had a design target of 10 gigabits per second, but when you have young motivated kids in the lab, they always try and say, what happens if I turn it up to 12 and a half? What happens if I move it harder? In fact, we were able to overclock this system and actually demonstrate 50 gigabits per second on a system that was, de that was designed for 40 gigabits per second. Again, the uh, eyes remain open, the link remains stable, but you can see that we're getting an awful lot more jitter here, and so the bit error rate, although very good still in channels one through three, started to fall off here a little bit on channel four as jitter uh, sort of raised its ugly head, you might say. Extinction ratio is still very good, rise and fall time still good, so it's really jitter in a 10 gig system which starts to hurt you as you start to overclock it. No surprise there. Okay, talking fast. Um, 40 gigabits per second, maybe even 50 gigabits per second is an awful lot. Certainly Jeff talked about the IBM chip which was operating with four 10 gigabit per second ethernet uh, links and that's sort of standard out there in a the network now. Um, when our speaker from Huawei was talking about terabit per second links, it warmed so the cockles of my heart, because clearly that's where silica photonics is going to start to shine, where electrical cables are going to get much too thick and bulky in a system. The technology I've dem we've demonstrated here and discussed today has really been about 40 gigabits, 50 gigabits per second. Uh, how we get to a terabit per second is really a design aspect for us. We can scale up, which means essentially instead of operating at 10 or 12 gigabits per second, you can operate at higher data rates. I won't presume to tell the electronic data people or the IC people what their chips are going to do in the future, but I think 25 gigabits per second would be an awfully nice number. Certainly, we've demonstrated 40, so we can do faster than that. Uh, the nice thing about having a WDM technology is that you can also do what we would call scale out. So in essence, you're not lined up or locked into four wavelengths. You can do eight wavelengths. The cutting edge transatlantic transpacific cables now do hundreds of wavelengths or maybe 100 wavelengths. Uh, those types of things are possible as well. So some combination of both line rate scaling and WDM scaling will allow you to get sort of more aggregate bandwidth per fiber. Of course, one fiber isn't what you're locked into physically either. You can put multiple fibers out there as well. And so potentially many fibers at 100 gigabits per second or higher can give you these terabit per second data rates that are, that are required. All of these things are possible and sort of part of the ongoing research here. Um, what are you going to do with it? 
right? I mean, that's kind of one of the things our management always asks us. You have these great optical pipes. You can do all this sort of stuff. Where are you going to put it? How am I going to sell it? You know, how is it going to impact the network? You know, there's lots of different ways to integrate sort of optical links, or you might just think 10 gig Ethernet sort of modules or something in a system. What's done today, sort of onboard connection. You put modules at the edge of your board or of your packet. This sort of fiber connection or electrical cable connection goes out into the network, and you build up network switches of that, and you move forward. Certainly, you can replace these, these uh, modules with higher speed modules in the future, 100 gigabit Ethernet or more, terabit per second silicon photonics in the future, and there should be some benefit from doing that. Maybe the holy grail, as we discussed earlier, would be the integration of silicon photonics or the you know, very, very high bandwidth I.O. off of a CPU or a network interface. Uh, clearly, that's going to have a great deal of advantage in the future as well. You can imagine not having to drive through any of this electrical link to drive down the parasitics, drive down your power consumption, really drive up the performance of the network. What I've tried to discuss and demonstrate to you today, this PCB-like board uh, fabrication or manufacturing technology, has really been focused here on what we call the topside package interconnect. Really integrating these discrete silicon photonics components, the optical sort of sub-assemblies that we talked about on both the transmit and receive side, onto the top of one of these packages. So now our electrical interface doesn't go through a package, through a board, through a socket, across a motherboard, through vias, and sort of you know, give your IO designers all that challenge. But now we integrate it on top of a package like that. You've decreased all the latencies, you've decreased the loss, you've decreased the parasitics, and you've increased the performance, decreased the power efficiency. Decreased power consumption, increased power efficiency of your system. Again, this seems to be a, a, an interesting conversation uh, we have with our architects as there's a lot of approaches here and you're actually balancing cost, performance, flexibility, uh, and network in the end. One particular application uh, I thought we would throw out there for you as, as, a, as this is a network session uh, was what we would call remote optical memory. So here you know, we have a processor, hopefully an Intel processor here, talking to a whole bunch of DDR3 memory. App, uh, um, Clearly, for the highest end applications, you're putting out these blades there that are uh, limited, both in mechanical space, thermal load, et cetera. Moving forward, make those links optical links, and suddenly now distance becomes much, much, much less of a concern in your, in your system. Bandwidth becomes less of a concern. Suddenly, you could put all this memory off into the side. And although you know, the Huawei processor might be able to take all of it, if it needs any more, this is at the end of the optical link. Um, again, so. We're hoping, or we're expecting a higher capacity and higher bandwidth, reduce system costs, reduce uh, system power efficiency. Uh, distance flexibility is suddenly now latency is going to be much less of an issue. Uh, board, board cost reduction, hopefully, as you're not sort of putting so many laminates on your board in order to route these very, very wide sort of parallel buses. And again, potentially reducing overall system. Um, it would be nice if the world were you know, simple, but of course, we live in the real world, and so it's not. Integrating silicon photonics onto a processor package clearly has thermal and mechanical challenges, clearly mechanical interface challenges, part of what we're working on today, but we've shown you, I think, the first step moving forward. So here we have demonstrated uh, the first silicon uh, hybrid laser and modulator WDM link, all the technologies required, we think, from end to end to integrate it in the system. We demonstrated, I think, a very good four-channel WDM system, 40 gigabits per second, and a pretty good one at 50 gigabits per second. I would be uh, remiss if I did not acknowledge all the many, many collaborators, both within Intel and specifically at Orion and Micron for their collaboration in helping to make this all possible. Thank you all very much. So we have time for a few questions. <laughs> Maybe while people say, I might have a quick question. So. The chip memory interface, we're already at, in some cases, over terabit per second there. So um, how soon can we get this uh, optical to memory interconnect? Yeah, there you go. Um, so let me preface this by saying we live in Intel Labs. We're uh, demonstrating sort of a research project which has resulted, I think, in a whole suite of technologies. So unfortunately, you're going to have to ask a business unit for that. Having said that, we work very hard to influence business units. And I don't think, you know, five-ish years would be outside their own possibility. Certainly, I'd be happy to be back here in five years and telling you about our, our product. Don Draper, uh, True Circuits. So I'm sorry, I Trump. see that you were um, uh, bonding, wafer bonding your transmitters and, uh, and photodiodes uh, onto your processor chip. Um, so the natural question comes up is, uh, 
uh, maybe I'm looking a little bit too far ahead here, that uh, for high volume manufacturing, you're going to have the usual known good die problem there uh, with testing all yeah, of those pieces. Yeah, um, so I think maybe I just didn't describe it very accurately. What we were doing is bonding indium phosphide that makes the laser onto the silicon photonics chip itself. We were actually bond bonding indium phosphide dye, singulated dye, onto a, a silicon wafer. If you know, we were to consider bonding an entire big wafer of indium phosphide, if such a thing were possible, onto a big wafer of silicon, I, then we yeah. would indeed have the exact same problem that you yeah. described. Right, I, is, didn't, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean that you were bonding the whole wafer. Uh, I misstated that. What I meant to say was that you're bonding those individual uh, dye onto the, the silicon. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, you, do I understand that you, you are bonding the laser diodes and the, and the uh, 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 photodiodes onto a, a processor chip? No. No, these oh. were just silicon chips. The images okay. I showed you were just right. silicon photonics chips. Right, right. And so that just integration of silicon photonics and CPU on the same substrate we think is some years off. Right. And so uh, the question then comes, do you see the possibility that the, uh, you could apply the indium phosphide, you know, deposition technology directly to the chips so that you avoid the, the dye attach problem? Uh, certainly a lot of people work on that. It has its pluses and minuses. I think the challenge is that those growth steps that you're talking about sweating in a chamber are extremely expensive. If you're going to put a big wafer in that, in that chamber, and you're going to take up a lot of area and take a lot of time and expense and then throw away 99% of it, it may not be the best cost um, strategy to, to approve. To approach. Uh, exactly what I was thinking. Good. Okay. Thank you. We're well aligned then. So I'm Todd Besnick at Quantum. We had a tutorial yesterday where everyone was talking about photonics, so it was mm -hmm. fascinating. And Good. Um, everyone used ring modulators, no marching soldiers. And, and then all of a sudden today, you come up with this different design. Can mm -hmm. you discuss the trade-offs? Yeah, of course. Um, ring modulators are, are beautiful devices, aren't they? They're small, very, very low capacitance, and uh, they look very nice. They promise, I think, perhaps maybe the lowest power consumption that's out there. The challenge with making a ring modulator is that it becomes very, very sensitive. It's a resonance device, so it, it depends very, very carefully on making a condition which is stable. So that uh, has to be stable over manufacturing flows, it has to be stable over wavelength, it has to be stable over temperature. Those are, we believe, significant challenges. And so our design is stable over those things, sort of maybe not inherently, but certainly designed to be more stable, I think, than those devices. If those challenges can be or eventually solved for a ring resonator, they'll be very attractive devices. Okay, let's thank Drew again.